at the end of the Second World War, there were a number of senior members of the Nazi government who were brought to the Nuremberg trials. This included Hermann Göring and Rudolf Hess, those men who remained with Hitler throughout his rise to the position of dictator. There were a number of men who were condemned to death following the trials, and they were then executed by the American executioner John C. Woods in rather brutal circumstances. But at the end of the trial, there were a number of men who had been part of the inner circle and of Hitler's war cabinet, who were actually spared the hangman's noose, and they then lived a large part of their remaining days inside of a prison within Berlin. Spandau Prison became the place where seven top Nazis, convicted, were held, and the final prisoner, Rudolf Hess, died within the walls under rather strange circumstances. But what is the story of the last Nazis of Spandau Prison? To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe. Spandau Prison was built in the 19th century and was found on Wilhelmstrasse in Berlin, but it was before the Second World War, a place where a number of opponents of Hitler and the Nazis found themselves locked up in what was referred to as a protective custody camp. It came before the concentration camps, and inside of the prison the Gestapo did torture and beat the prisoners, and later inmates were sent to concentration camps. But at the end of the conflict, the prison became under the jurisdiction of the British sector of West Berlin, and it was overseen by the US, the UK, Soviet and French forces. Following the Nuremberg trials, it was a place where those men who were given prison sentences by the International Military Tribunal were locked up. Spandau was not the place where the executions occurred, with these taking place inside of Nuremberg Prison, at the hands of the American military executioner. But it was a prison that was used for the long-term incarceration of those sentenced to various lengths of imprisonment. Life inside the prison was very strictly laid out by the prison regulations, and the rules were also rather strict. Prisoners were allowed to send a letter, which was at the start limited to one page a month, and speaking with other inmates was also banned, as were newspapers and the writing of diaries. Visits from family members were also very short and brief, with the former Nazis getting 15 minutes every two months with loved ones. But also every 15 minutes, bright flashlights were shone into the prisoner cells. As time went on, the rules got much more lenient, but the Soviet guards were said to have been more strict than the others. Each day the inmates were ordered to get up at 6am and wash as well as clean their cells, and they had breakfast and remained in the garden until lunch. They were allowed an afternoon rest before they were then allowed back into the garden. Lights out was at 10pm and the prisoners were also allowed to have a shave and a haircut when required. On the other hand, there were some lines of communication kept quiet for the last Nazis of Spandau as some guards carried messages for them as they were sympathetic to them. Some including Albert Speer even wrote a lot of his autobiography somehow in prison and this was then smuggled out and was even then published. Also another prisoner, Walter Funk, managed to get his hands on what was cognac on tap, and he would also share this with prisoners whenever he could. But the prisoners of Spandau were known as the Spandau Seven. Inside of the groups, much of the bitterness between the remaining members of the inner circle still existed, and there were fights for power and influence even within the prison. Many of the prisoners had been rivals fighting for the affection of Hitler, and there were some of the Seven who grouped together, but others did not. Rudolf Hess was viewed as insane, and he along with Albert Speer were not liked by the other men, and they were seen as loners. Speer even received hatred for the fact he spoke out against Hitler, and admitted his guilt in the Nuremberg trials, and he even apologised for his actions. The two Grand Admirals and former members of the Kriegsmarine, Admiral Dönitz, the former president and Hitler's successor, along with Admiral Erich Reder, became friends and remained close despite being rivals during the conflict. Bauder von Schirach, the Hitler Youth leader, along with Walter Funk, also became close friends, and Konstantin von Neurath seemed to be on good terms with each of the men. These were the prisoners who were to have varying stays inside of Spandau, but most refused to recant their Nazi beliefs, and there was much bickering and arguments between the men during their time behind bars. But who specifically were the Spandau Seven? Konstantin von Neurath was the foreign minister of Germany before the war broke out, serving in this position from 1932 to 1938. 
he was said to have been a key player in Hitler's early land grabs and in defying the Treaty of Versailles, and he was later defiant in some of Hitler's orders. He was made the Reich's protector of Bohemia and Moravia, and his rule of the land was rather mild compared to what happened later when Reinhard Heydrich took over control of the land, and because of this he was removed from his position. But the Allies at the end of the conflict prosecuted von Neurath, and he was accused of conspiracy to commit crimes against peace and planning, initiating and waging wars of aggression, as well as crimes against humanity and war crimes. Von Neurath's crimes against humanity related to his short role as a protector of Bohemia and Moravia, and in keeping the Czech resistance down, and he also ordered the executions of a number of university students. But as he held no significant position during the Second World War, and he was seen as a more minor war criminal compared to others, he was sentenced to 15 years imprisonment. As mentioned inside of the prison, he was said to have got on well with most of the other men. Von Neurath was released on the 6th of November 1954 due to ill health, and he died just under two years later, on the 14th of August 1956. The faction or pair of former naval officers, Dernitz and Raider, were colloquially known by the other prisoners as the Admiralty. When ordered to perform certain jobs, they would work together on them, and Raider took up position as a librarian inside of the prison library, with Dernitz acting as the assistant. The pair obviously had long and illustrious careers inside of the German Navy, and Dernitz was appointed as Hitler's successor and as the president of Nazi Germany, following Hitler's death. Both of the men were rather standoffish with the other prisoners, and Raider specifically hated the other prisoners, who would show a lack of discipline and poor behaviour towards guards, and he got greatly offended by this. The pair, despite spending time together, did debate and argue about different aspects of the Navy in the Second World War. Dernitz managed to avoid a death sentence at Nuremberg, as he managed to prove that Allied warships had actually committed war crimes too, and his lawyer managed to get him away from the charges of waging unrestricted submarine warfare against neutral unarmed shipping. He was sentenced to 10 years and remained unrepentant, and also rejected Albert Speer's ideas in getting others to end their devotion to Hitler. Dönitz was released on the 30th of September 1956, and he lived another 24 years before dying in December 1980. Eric Rader was sentenced to life imprisonment, and he had expected to be sentenced to death. There were campaigns to free him outside Spandau, but on the 26th of September 1955, he was released for ill health, dying just over four years later at the age of 84. Walter Funk was a German economist who was the president of the Reichsbank, and he was overseeing much of the German economy during the war and in the build-up to it. He was tried with other Nazis at Nuremberg, and throughout his trial he was labelled as a banker of the gold teeth, as he was said to have been the head of the bank that stole gold teeth from the prisoners of the concentration camps, and these were then melted down by the Reichsbank for bullion. He was throughout the proceedings distressed by what was shown to the court, and he wept when evidence was given, and he was even given sleeping pills. Funk was sentenced to life imprisonment, but was released on the 16th of May 1957 for poor health, and he died just over three years later. Bauder von Chirac was the former Hitler Youth leader, and he was a man who was responsible for the forced deportations of dozens of thousands of people when he served as a Reich governor of Vienna. At the trial, Chirac denounced Hitler and spoke against him, and he took a different approach to others, but Chirac rejected responsibility for the Holocaust, and he did admit to being a former anti-Semite. He said, It is the greatest, the most devilish mass murder known to history. The murder was ordered by Adolf Hitler, as is obvious from his last will and testament. He and Himmler jointly committed that crime, which for all time will be a stain in the annals of our history. It is a crime which fills every German with shame. He claimed he did not know about the extermination camps, however it was proven that he had known about these, and that he had deported thousands of people to camps. Chirac also tried to portray the Hitler Youth as nothing more than Boy Scouts, rather than the indoctrinating group that prepared boys to become soldiers. Chirac expected to be hanged, but was acquitted of crimes against peace, and was found guilty of crimes against humanity. It was found he was not involved in Hitler's plans for an aggressive war, but was sentenced to 20 years inside of Spandau prison. Within the walls of Spandau, his wife divorced him, 
and Chirac was also struck by Russian prison guards, and he actually suffered a detached retina and lost his sight in his left eye. Inside of the prison, he also suffered a pulmonary embolism and was diagnosed with thrombosis. He was released from prison on the 1st of October 1966 after he served a full sentence. He then gave a number of interviews after his release. But von Schirach then died in August 1974. Albert Speer is known as Hitler's architect and he was formerly the Minister of Armaments. Speer was found guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity relating to slave labour and he narrowly avoided going to the gallows for his crimes. He was referred to inside of Spandau as prison number 5 and throughout his time behind bars, many letters were smuggled out for him. Some even fundraised whilst he was behind bars, and this money was then used to support Speer's family. Princes, as mentioned, were banned from writing memoirs, but Speer managed to do this behind bars, and these totaled around 20,000 pages. He wrote his book Inside the Third Reich, and also then wrote the Spandau Diaries, and he tried to portray himself as a tragic hero, but Speer spent a lot of time behind bars trying to keep fit mentally and physically. He created a garden complete with lawns and flower beds and also embarked on daily walks around the garden and he would, whilst walking, imagine he was walking around the world and he mapped out his distances to places in the outside world, walking over 19,000 miles when he was locked up. Speer also read much in prison and also learned further languages and he claimed he wrote 5,000 books in Spandau. Albert Speer was released after serving his full term of 20 years on the 1st of October 1966. He portrayed himself as a good Nazi, and after the war he was seen on many TV chat shows, and Speer became almost a celebrity. In the years later though, the myth of the good Nazi has been busted, as evidence was found that Speer knew exactly what was truly happening inside the Third Reich, and actually signed off, are some of the horrific actions. But the man referred to sometimes as the last Nazi, or the last man of Spandau, was Rudolf Hess. Hess was the longest living of the Spandau Seven, and he was formerly the deputy Führer to Hitler. Hess held this position until he made a failed attempt to negotiate peace with the British, as he crash-landed inside of Scotland, and there remained a prisoner of war. Following this, Hitler said if Hess ever set foot inside Germany again, then he would have been executed by his former friend. Hess was spared execution, as it was said he remained a prisoner of war during much of the conflict, when the persecution went further and was ramped up, but Hess was prisoner number seven. He was visited inside Spandau by his wife, after he was admitted to hospital for a perforated ulcer. But behind bars, Hess suffered physically and mentally, and he cried long into the night, and complained of stomach pains, and he also suspected he was being poisoned. He was analysed by many psychiatrists, who confirmed he was not eligible to be moved to a mental hospital. Hess spent the rest of his life inside of Spandau, and one by one he saw the other inmates being released, yet he knew he would likely never get out unless he was ill. But the huge prison had only one prisoner from 1966 until Hess died in 1987, and it was costing around 800,000 Deutschmarks a year, to imprison one man, Rudolf Hess. The conditions of his imprisonment got easier, and Hess was allowed to move around the prison block himself, and was actually allowed to make his own routine. He was also permitted to watch television and to tend to the garden, and a lift was installed costing thousands, so he could access the garden easier. There were many appeals lodged to release Rudolf Hess from imprisonment, but all of these failed. In September 1979, it was proven that Hess was suffering from prostate cancer and he said he would refuse treatment unless he was released. But behind bars, he continued to be an anti-Semite and also a terrible Nazi and he hindered the attempts for his release because of this. On the 17th of August 1987, at the age of 93, Rudolf Hess was found dead inside of the summer house which had been set up as a reading room. He was found with an extension cord thrown over a window latch and secured around his neck. In August 1987, Spandau prison was demolished to prevent it becoming a shrine. All of the materials from the prison were ground to powder and were either buried at a former RAF airbase or were thrown into the North Sea. In terms of those prisons of Spandau, the first released was Konstantin von Neurath, shortly followed by Erich Krader, 
and then Carl Dernitz. Walter Funk was the fourth released, and then von Schirach and Speer, before Hess was left inside Spandau. Spandau was a prison that was heavily underutilised, as a huge number of soldiers and prison guards were there to oversee the site, in which they were only guarding seven inmates in a prison, which was meant to hold around 600. It was hugely costly, but those men of Spandau who were held there were said to have been the last Nazis and the last remnants of Hitler's inner circle. Each of these men could have been sent to the hangman's gallows, but they managed to escape execution. Their ordeals inside Spandau were varied, but Spandau prison became an iconic prison, where all the prisoners were never on the same page, and inside the walls there was still a bastion of Nazi sentiment and devotion to Adolf Hitler. Thanks for watching. To support our channel, please make sure to subscribe, and once again, thank you so much for watching.